be with you today and to uh, open God's Word with you. We'll be in Matthew chapter 18 this morning. Matthew chapter 18, if you want to turn there, we'll be picking up there in just a moment. Um, as we get started today, I uh, would like to just, uh, on because I do see that we have a number of visitors with us lately. The last few weeks we've had a number of, of, of you visiting with us, and we really appreciate that. appreciate you being here. Uh, if you have any questions about Grace Bible Church, who we are, what we believe, uh, if you want more information about something, uh, if you'd like to you know, be baptized, you'd like to become a member, you'd just like to find out more about kids' ministry, in the back of your pew there's an information card. It's called a Connect card. We'd love for you to fill that out. Just let us know who you are, if there's some way that we can minister to you, even if it's maybe a prayer request or whatever, we would love to have you uh, fill that out and leave that with us. It's a, it's a privilege for us to, to minister to you in that way. So again, I'm Pastor Jason. I'm one of the elders here. Um, and so um, today, just like to officially welcome you if we haven't uh, done that uh, already. And so um, again, we'll be in Matthew chapter 18 this morning. And I'd like to uh, begin, we'll begin today in verse 12. And this, uh, this, this study that we're doing through the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we've, we've come to this section, uh, and I'm going to call section like chapter 18 and 19. They really kind of go together. Uh, chapter 18 is one long conversation that Jesus has with his disciples that happens like all at one time. And then chapter 19 actually is a different situation, but it's on a similar topic. Okay, so these... Uh, verses that we're reading in chapter 18, many of us, these are well-known verses that we are, are hearing. Today we're going to hear some more. We're going to talk about the parable of the lost sheep. We're going to talk about uh, what, what the Bible says about how to, how to minister to when someone sins against us. Okay, these are verses that we've heard and heard and heard, but chances are good that we've never heard them in context. We've never heard them as part of this is Jesus responding to the disciples after them having asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Okay, so that's really the, the, it's really a conversation Jesus is having about that topic. And he really lays it out for them and, and spells it out uh, in, a pro, in a progression that I think that we, if we come to really appreciate who, who Jesus is talking to, what he's talking to them about, it's like, oh, like that's what he's talking about. I mean, it's not hidden information. But when we take the verse out of context, sometimes it's like, okay, we rob it of its uh, significance. So anyway, the, the, this whole unit here, this whole chapter, chapter 18, is really begins with the, the disciples coming to Jesus and saying, who's greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, we know the disciples argued about that a lot, okay? In fact, they were really, I mean, even up to the Last Supper, they're arguing about this. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And what they really mean is, which one of us is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Which one of us is going to come in, you know, you know, up here? And so um, to kind of use a military example, you know, when you go in the military, everybody enlists and they're, they're a, was it E1? All right, well, we want to come in as an officer. All right, we want to start up here. We don't want to start down here. We want to start up here. So, you know, we want the pay grade. We want the status. We want the, you know, all this up here. We don't want to come in down here. <laughs> and uh, so... That's their question, you know, which one of us is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Which, which of us are going to be coming in as an officer? Uh, but Jesus takes a toddler, takes a child, sets a child uh, on his lap. He's holding this, this little child in his arms, and, and he begins to teach them a lesson. And so last week we, we read verses 1 through 10. And Jesus begins to explain that everything that we know about greatness, everything that we know and we have apprehended from this world experience, Okay, this world system that leaves God out. What we have learned from this world system does not apply. So in, in our world kingdoms, you know, we talked about last week, so the, the, you know, the way that we achieve success and greatness, uh, the way that we most effectively become great uh, is, is that we operate out of a position of strength, uh, pride, self-esteem, uh, independence, you know, wisdom, power, intelligence, um, you know, every man for himself, the strongest survive, and that's really the, the way in which this world, like, aspires to greatness is through those things. 
Jesus said, no, it's very different in my kingdom. And Jesus uses the child to illustrate that, you know, for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says that it's you enter like a child, like a small one, a little one. In fact, he begins to call his believers little ones. It was a pattern that John would continue. He would say to believers, he'd say, my little children. It's a reference back to this conversation. Jesus says, you come into the kingdom of heaven like a child, like a little one, with nothing, humble, without resources, without direction, without wisdom, without purpose, without strength, completely dependent on the Father. That's how you come in to the kingdom of God. And then secondly, Jesus teaches that if you want to become great in the kingdom of heaven, uh, it is it's very different than the world's strategy for greatness. In fact, we become great in the kingdom of heaven when we stop thinking of ourselves, right? And we think about others. Uh, we, we were challenged to be humble, Jesus says. Um, it says, unless, uh, or it says, whoever humbles himself like this child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humility is exalted. Um, looking to the needs of others is top priority. Loving God's little ones, okay, his other little ones, is top priority. Receiving God's little ones, his babies, loving his babies is loving God. And on the flip side, he says, the absolute no-no is to lead his little ones into temptation. And God says, there's a great, great price to be paid for that, uh, leading his little ones into temptation. You love my kids, you love me. You hurt my kids, you hurt me. And so great reward associated with loving his little ones, great sorrow attached to leading his little ones into temptation. So it really sets the stage for what Jesus is going to say next. Um, just this idea of how much God values the believer. Each individual believer is his little one, okay, his child, his little baby. And so with that in, uh, in context, let's, let's go ahead and begin reading verse 12. It says, um, get my clicker working here. There we go. Jesus says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Now, we've heard this parable and we've we've alluded to this parable in lots of you know lots of times a lot of christian circles uh, but oftentimes this passage is used in very evangelistic context that you know there's unsaved people out there and god cares about every unsaved person and you know every unsaved person matters and, and god goes after that one unsaved person you know to bring them to the knowledge of the gospel okay and i'm not going to tell you that god doesn't that God doesn't care about unsaved people. He does. But as we read this, we come to find out in the context of the chapter, that's not who he's actually talking about at this particular moment. Okay, God does love unbelievers. He goes after them. He sent his son to die for them, but, but that's not who he's talking about here. Who, who is he talking about? He's talking about his little ones, his believers, who go astray. So let's, so let's with that in mind, let's go back and look at that again. So if a man has a hundred sheep, a hundred little ones, and one of them has gone astray, okay, so how, how does a little one, how does a believer, okay, in the family of God, how, does they, how do they go astray? It's through something called sin, right? Through something called sin. And, and all of us at some point in our lives are probably this sheep, aren't we? Okay, we get off track. We somehow, we wander off. And we get away from the herd, we get away from the shepherd, okay, we go astray, okay, it happens. And so it says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more 
than over the 99 that never went astray. So when we think about this idea of these little ones, these sheep going astray, you know, the idea that they went astray implies that they were, prior to going astray, they were a member of the flock. Right? These, are not, these are not wild animals. These are sheep that are part of this shepherd's flock. They belong. Okay, they are his. Okay, these are not unbelievers. These are not people. That, these are not unsaved people he's referencing here. These are believers. These are his little ones who formerly were in fellowship and communion with the shepherd and with the flock, and now they're not. Does this make sense? And so, so that's the first thing I think we want to see about this. So, as I kind of said earlier, you know, how, how many of how many of us have been off track? How many of us have been that sheep? I think probably most of us have been that sheep at some point. But I think the thing that really stands out to me here, first thing is this is about believers. Second thing that stands out to me is God's individual love. And I know this kind of this might sound kind of crazy because you know we always say the Bible is about God's love and. God so loved the world. But maybe this has been you, and I know this was me for a period of time. It's easy to read the Bible and, and just and say, okay, God loves the world. God has this sort of blanket love that's for, for mankind. You know, God so loved the world, you know, because there's so many of them and there's so many sinners that, okay, I'll give my son and, and he'll die for, for, to redeem, you know, all of these billions of people. And we can kind of almost grasp that. I mean, that's big, okay? But to go further and to say that God has an individual, unique love for one person, okay? And let me narrow it down even further. God has a unique love for me, for, for just for me. Like, how big is God and how small am I? But he loves me. He loves one sheep enough to stop what he's doing and to go after that sheep. That's kind of mind-blowing when you really, like, okay, we read it, but do we get it? That God loves me. He loves me that much. Sometimes we struggle with that, that God loves me. He loves you. You know, when I'm reading this right here, it says there's, I don't think this is statistically accurate, though, by the way. There's 100 sheep and one goes astray. <laughs> I think it's probably a higher ratio than that. <laughs> But he's just making an example. He says, there's a hundred sheep, one goes astray. You know, if I'm a shepherd and I have a hundred sheep and one goes astray, I'm thinking, that's a loss I can live with. All right, that's a ratio I can live with. That's 1% loss. Okay, I, I mean, I, I am not going to, I would not as a, as a shepherd, okay, I, would, I, would, I would say, you know what, that's, I'm not, I'm not even going to go after that sheep not worth it it's not worth my time it's not worth my energy but what motivates god to go after that one sheep is that he has a deep love for that sheep for that little one his little one he loves that little one so much he's not willing to abandon him or her in their sin and in their their waywardness he's not willing to abandon them he's not willing to give them up he's not willing to just write them off God loves you and he loves me that much. God's individual love for you. There's something else that stood out to me about God's love in this passage. You know, if we, if we hadn't already read the whole passage, I mean, I think it would, this is kind of how it would go, like in my mind. Like if I'm God, I'm thinking like, what would God probably do in this situation? I'd probably say, he leaves the 99 on the mountains. He went in search of the one that went astray. And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he said to that sheep, how dare you? Well, it's about time you came to your senses. I told you so. Boy, I hope you learned your lesson. You got yourself into this mess. Let's see you get yourself out. But that's not what it says. That's what I would say. But what does it say God does? God rejoices. 
that is cool. That is love. That's a love like on a whole other level. Like we think about God's love, it rejoices. God's love is, is like celebrates that, that they came back. He celebrates that they have changed their mind. He's, he, he's excited. Like, what does it take to get God excited? I mean, God made the universe. That's something we can get excited about. I mean, as we look at, you know, they got this new telescope now, and you can look out and see, like, they're zooming in on this dark spot in the sky where it looks like there's nothing. They zoom in on it, and there's like billions of planets and galaxies and stars. That's exciting. God says, there's something that gets me excited, and it is when one of these little ones comes back into fellowship. God is all about that. He rejoices. It says so much so that he rejoices over it more than the 99 that never went astray. And Jesus says this, so, listen to this, for this reason, it says, it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. That's huge. Family matters. We're talking about family matters. What matters in the family of God? We, we've learned so far in this chapter that what matters is that we love his little one. What matters is that we don't lead one of his little ones into temptation. And what we learn here is that in the family of God, what matters is every individual one of his babies. Every one of them matter to him. One other thing stands out to me in this passage. And it's, you're probably looking at it right now, and, and it's, it's kind of making you squirm a little bit. It's one of the words up here in, on the screen. It's probably the last one. Right? Perish. It says, not God's will that any of these little ones should perish. What's perish? Perish means be destroyed. Perish means, means death, means consequences. It means loss, destruction. The Bible says the consequences of sin is death. Okay, the wages of sin is death. So it should be said here, and I think we need to understand is, you know, you want to take the whole context of Scripture, or the whole counsel of Scripture. What we do know is that Jesus paid the eternal penalty of sin for every believer. Okay, those who believe in him, it says, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation. Okay, eternally. Does not mean that there are, are not consequences to sin. There is perishing that happens. There's several things. We talked about this this morning in CT, actually, with the youth. You know, when, when I sin, when I'm that little one who separates myself from the flock, okay, there are consequences, aren't there? There are consequences, and even if I come back into fellowship, which is God's will, He rejoices. Okay, there are consequences to that sin. There are consequences now. God doesn't, even though He rejoices that I'm back, He does not erase the consequences of my sin. You know, not necessarily. Okay, sometimes He can, he can um, you know, help you through those. Okay, but He doesn't always erase them. So there's a perishing, there is a loss there. There's also, in an even bigger sense, there is a loss of reward. There is a loss in heaven. There is a loss of, of reward. There is a loss of things that we can't even fathom the richness of it. There's it a loss right now. There is a perishing that happens. God doesn't want that. The first chapter of Ephesians talks about the riches that God has bestowed upon us through Christ that we will enjoy with Him forever. But as we walk out of fellowship with him now, okay, we, we lose some of that. We lose some of that reward. Even though our eternal address does not change, okay, there are things that are burning up as I walk out of fellowship with him. Um, you know, I was thinking about the, you know, talking about consequences. You know, Ray, Ray Medley was in here a couple weeks ago, and uh, I wasn't here for it, but... He, he told uh, about the guy who was the murderer, and he was in prison, and he accepted Christ. You know, he accepted Christ, and now he is a, he is a child of God. Okay, he's going to heaven. His eternal destination has been changed in a good way. 
that does not erase the consequences of his sin. There is a consequence that will have to be paid. He he is in prison. You know, I always laugh about this. Um, it's just a funny illustration of a serious principle. But uh, if you've ever seen that movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And there's a scene where the guys, I mean, they're bad guys. They're robbing banks and stuff. And then one guy goes down to the prayer meeting and he gets baptized. And he says, oh, all my sins has been forgiven. And uh, the other guy looks at him and he says, well, he says, well, you might be set right with, with the Lord, but, you know, the state of Mississippi's got other plans for you. <laughs> you know, they catch you. You're going to jail, buddy. Um, and I think in a sense, okay, there's, there is a perishing that happens when we walk in sin. So, all right, we're going to move on to the next section, but I don't want you to think that these sections are unrelated. So, Jesus has just told this, this parable about how God goes after that one person, that one lost sheep, that one little one, and that his, his, his desire is to have that one restored. And so we can read that and think, well, that's great. You know what? I'm glad God does that. Well, guess what? He's going to enlist you and me to participate in that plan. Just like his plan for salvation, and God is enlisting us in that plan. By the way, this is what I'm doing. Here's how you can be a part. Okay, this is what God is about to share. There's when his little ones get out of fellowship, it's important to him. And he says right here, gives us an example of how that we get involved in going after them. Once you read with me, it says in verse uh, 15 and following, it says. Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, okay, there's a little one, got off track. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Your brother is now back in the flock. He's back in fellowship with the shepherd. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. He goes on to say, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. In other words, have no fellowship with him. So as we read that, and again, it's important to understand the context. The whole thrust of this chapter is God's little ones, his children, his babies. How do we love them? Well, we love them, in, in this case, by going after them. Okay, by going after them. And so, Jesus gives a very tangible, like real illustration or application. He says, if your brother sins against you, go. Tell him his fault. So, what's the, what's the command here? Jesus is saying, Go. Go. He's saying go. You. You go. Okay, and what's the qualifier? He says there's, a, there's an if clause there. So what, what needs to be in place for us to go? Okay, Jesus says, if your brother, okay, so who's your brother? Who's your sister? Okay, other little ones in the, in the family of Christ. He's not talking about unbelievers. He's talking about believers who are in sin. Okay, so we, we're good so far. When are we to go? It's another believer, brother, sister, another fellow child of God who is in sin. Okay, and that person has sinned against, okay, against me. Okay, but if they've sinned against me, who else have they sinned against? God, okay, because I'm one of his little ones. Okay, they're one of his little ones. There's a, there's a, a breach in the fellowship. There's a sin issue that has things out of whack. And Jesus says, God, not God's will, that any of his little ones should perish, that they should suffer loss. So, your brother, another little one sins against you, here's what you do. You, you go, okay, you go. You go and you verbally, you tell him his fault or her. You go to that person. Okay, you don't Facebook it. Okay, you don't 
post it out there. You don't gossip about it. You don't tell 14 other people. You go to the person who sinned and you say to that person his fault or her fault. And I'm going to be the first to tell you right now that <laughs> I look at that and I say, Ooh, I don't think I want to do that. That sounds really hard. Okay, and I have not done that. And I'm willing to bet if we took a poll. Most of you have avoided that. I know I've avoided it. I have, I've even read that and I thought, no, nah, I can't do that. Okay, the only thing is, if I don't do that, not only is my brother not reconciled according to the plan that God put in place, but now guess what? Guess who else is out of fellowship? Me, because I'm not doing what I'm called to do. So I'm telling you, this is an area where I just, and I'm just going to say in the last few years, this is something that God has been impressing more and more on me, and I still don't get it right every time. But this is the plan. This is what God sets forth. He says, this is the right way. This is, this is how you participate in this really awesome thing that I'm doing. And I am behind you in this. I am for you in this. This is how it works best. But he says, if your brother sins against you, go, go to that person, tell him his fault. Face to face is best. Okay, there's instances where Paul, remember, confronted Peter, confronted him to his face. He says, Peter, you're in the wrong about this. There's other instances where Paul was not able like to physically go, like he was not able to physically go to Corinth. Okay, there was a man in Corinth who was involved in some really gross stuff that I won't say because it's not PG. Really gross stuff. And Paul wrote them a letter. And he says, you need to deal with this, with this thing. He wrote, he wrote a very harsh uh, letter about it. Okay, confronted it. Face to face is best. It says, go to that person, tell them your fault. You know, of course, this is a perfect plan because it's God's plan. <laughs> We're not perfect people, but it's a perfect plan. Um, but when we do that, just understand first, going, that's our responsibility. Okay, going is our responsibility. It's not our responsibility to tell others yet. Um, it's also not our responsibility to stew and brew on it. Okay, we're supposed to go. Okay, we don't want to just hold on to it and hold on to it and hold on to it. And then, nah, I'm not going to go. That's, that's not the plan. So going verbally, going face to face, and not sandbagging. Now, this is something, I say that, and I know a lot of you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, when I was a kid, we used to play, we used to play cards a lot. Not gambling cards, but like, you know, rummy and stuff. Did you ever play that? You know, and you get the little suits and you lay them down. You got three of a kind, four of a kind, all this kind of stuff. So what we used to do is we would we'd fake it. We'd play with my brother and like we'd keep all them things in our hand until the last minute. And like he'd, he'd think, you know, I'm a long way from going out. And then all of a sudden, bam, 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 I'm out. <laughs> you know, and we would sandbag. Well, that's what we called it. It was just like accumulating things. And then you just you just lay them all out at one time, and it's like overwhelming. But people do that. It's like, I have a brother that sins against me. Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go to him. And, you know, they do something else. I'm not going to go to him. Oh, and there's a third thing. Well, I'm not going to go to him. But yet, I hold on to all of those things, and they accumulate. And then finally, I come to this, okay, I accumulate bitterness along with it. And then I go to that person and just blah. And it's overwhelming, okay? It's not the way that it's supposed to happen. We're supposed to, got an issue, go. Not wait until there's six and then go. And then this is really important. It says, it says um, tell him his fault. So there's something about verbalizing it that makes a big difference. Like God knows it, and this is God's plan. But sometimes when I go to that person, which I haven't always done, but when you go to that person and you begin to say, okay, i got to put into words exactly what it is that they did. Sometimes what I find is, okay, they didn't really sin. It's just more like they hurt my feelings. Okay, and I'm not saying feelings aren't important. But sometimes it's just more of a, okay, they said something that just rubbed me the wrong way. It's not really that they, it was a sin issue. 
But sometimes when I begin to have to verbalize it to the person, I realize <laughs> this is kind of silly. I am worked up about something that I really, it's not a sin issue. The thing I'm upset about is really, it's just more, it's more about me re reacting in the flesh to something that they did that's not really sinful. But another thing that often happens, let's just say it is a sin issue. I go to that person and I go to verbalize to them their sin issue. What also happens, I need to be prepared for this, is that oftentimes I go and it's not a one-sided thing. When I get there, I realize, guess who else has sinned in this thing? Me. Okay, I contributed to this problem in some kind of way. They've got something to repent of, but guess who else does too? Probably me. And so when I go and I verbalize it to that person for, to encourage them to be restored, well, a lot of times that comes out. And, you know, we both... <laughs> We both have some explaining to do, right? So the key about this is, he says, Jesus says, go tell him his fault between you and him alone to start with. So this is a private issue. And it says, if he listens to you, which is the goal, okay, you've gained your brother. So what is God's goal here? Okay, remember the sheep? He goes after the sheep to do what? To bring it back to the flock. To bring it back into fellowship. Not to go out there to punish it. He's not going out there to make sure that that sheep learned its lesson and I'm just going to, you know, we're going to punish the sheep. No, we're going to bring the sheep back into fellowship. So when, when you and I go to this believer or that believer comes to me, okay, the goal is restoration to fellowship. We want to bring this person back into fellowship. And um, so the intent is restoration. And so... Um, we're going to talk more about this next week, okay, because this is actually what the next part of Jesus' conversation deals with, is the whole process of repentance and forgiveness. Okay, we're going to cover that next week, so just hold on to that. But the, but the goal is repentance. The goal is restoration of fellowship. So the question comes up, what happens if we don't go? Well, there's at least four things that happen. If we, if we don't do this, okay, we don't go, uh, one thing that could okay, one thing that could happen is we could drop it and forget it. Um, okay, there is a verse, and I'll share it with you here. It's from Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs nineteen eleven says this: Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. Okay, there are some times when it would be best if I would ignore i would overlook an offense okay we're so thin-skinned okay i mean as americans 21st century americans we are offended about everything okay we have like everything sets us off what's the word uh, triggered we're triggered we're all we're always triggered so okay so if it's an offense okay someone has hurt my feelings it's not a sin issue okay it would be good if i could drop it and forget it now, not if it's a sin issue. Do you, do you see the difference? Okay, if it's a, truly, if it's somebody has hurt my feelings and I can drop it and forget it, that would be best. Okay? Okay, love does that. Love overlooks, like, what's it say in 1 Corinthians 13? Love is not easily offended. Okay, that's what love is. Now, it doesn't say love overlooks sin. That's different. So if it is a sin issue, we are commanded to go. There's not another option here. But if somebody's hurt my feelings and I can drop it and forget it, that's best. Uh, second thing, if we don't go, again, as I said earlier, we don't get a sandbag. We don't get to accumulate stuff until just bleh, we let it all out. Third thing, we don't get to gossip. Okay, if we don't go, okay, that does not give us permission to talk to 14 other people because I didn't go to that person. And probably the most important thing, if we don't go, understand that it leads to something called bitterness. Okay, if someone has sinned against me and I don't deal with it by going to them, what it festers into is something called bitterness. And bitterness is actually 
it's actually my sin. Okay, what that person did to me is their sin, but if I hold on to that and, and it turns into bitterness, then that's my sin. Okay, now I've got something between me and God. Um, so we need to understand that. So we're going to come back to that next week as we're talking about repentance and forgiveness. Uh, but the goal here, Jesus says, if he listens to you. So the goal is um, true repentance. Um, Jesus says, if he refuses to listen, this person does not receive the, you know, this um, admonition. It says, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established. Sometimes, and maybe you've seen this, if, you've, if you have any experience in this practice at all, Okay, if you've done this at all, going to someone who has sinned against you and having this conversation, um, a lot of times you have this conversation and, and when it's just the two people, a lot of times they just kind of get to this place and there's just, there's just no moving forward. Okay, there's just like we just can't, we just don't see a way out of this. So sometimes this next step, I mean, it's almost like God thought of this. <laughs> He did. I mean, it's, he's got a great plan. Take people with you. Take a couple of people with you, brothers, sisters, and the Lord, who can come into that situation and kind of help you see, see it, like, more objectively. Like, sometimes you get in it, it's like you can't see the forest for the trees. And, and, and so Jesus says, listen, goal is restoration. This matters in my family. Take a couple of people with you from the family to help you sort this thing out. And then he goes on to say, if, if, uh, if that doesn't work, he says, tell it to the church. Take it to the church. Take it to the body. Take it to the church leadership. Um, and so here, if, and, and we don't really have time to look at the whole example, but if the, the guy I was talking about in 1 Corinthians that Paul was um, calling out over his sexual sin, Okay, one of the things that Paul said, because they had gotten to this stage with that guy. Okay, this guy was not repentant. And so Paul says, listen, he says, let such a, such a one be handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Okay, we're talking about perishing in a physical sense, perishing. Let such a one be handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, God doesn't want that. Okay, He does not want his little ones to suffer loss does not want his little ones to suffer that sort of thing. But sometimes it requires that to get our attention. Okay, we have to spend some time out of fellowship. We shouldn't have to, but sometimes we have to. Like the prodigal son, remember the prodigal son? Okay, it took him blowing through all of his inheritance, becoming hungry, living in the pigsty, eating the pig slop before he finally like came to his senses one day and said oh this is silly why am i doing this i want to go and be reconciled with my father it's like you know light bulb goes off sometimes that suffering it, it, that that separation and the consequences that go with it actually serve to get our attention and say oh man it would be so much better if i would quit thinking the way that i was thinking and and repent and actually go back. God says, yes, I rejoice in that. So last verse here, and we'll close with this. Jesus said, okay, um, same context, okay? We haven't changed context. His little ones who are out of fellowship. Jesus says this, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Now, I don't believe that that is a standalone verse. Okay, now do I believe that Jesus is among us this morning? Yeah, I believe he is. I believe he lives, his Holy Spirit lives in every believer. I believe he's among us. But the immediate context that Jesus is talking about here is in this situation of restoring a, a wayward believer to the fellowship is, is, is when he's bringing this up. And he's saying, listen, two or three of you agree about this thing. He goes, listen, this, this is important. This has eternal consequences. And, 
And notice he begins this passage by saying again. So he's already said this once. So when did he say this before? Well, it was in chapter 16. And, and it was a similar type of situation. But in chapter 16, Jesus talked about locking things down. Remember the keys? He says, Peter, uh, he's talking to Peter about Peter's confession. And, and, and he has that thing where he says, um, uh, upon this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he talks about the keys, like what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven and so forth. So Jesus already talked about this once. Now he's talking about it again. And what's, what's the connection? So here's what I think it is. There are eternal consequences. There are eternal consequences, good and bad, that are being locked in, locked down, solidified, like nailed down right now, that will last into eternity. And those two, two areas are people's eternal salvation, and the restoration of wayward believers. Okay, so number one, Peter, when the conversation with Peter, uh, Jesus alluding to the gospel. And, um, and so what's being locked down today is uh, whether or not people are going to heaven. So people who do not have the gospel are depending on us. Okay, unreached people groups, and we've talked about that. Uh, you know, you and I have been commission to participate in that in that um, taking the gospel to the ends of the earth and and that gospel message is the difference between eternal life and eternal death and separation eternal heaven with god fellowship eternal hell okay that's been locked down right now today there's been there's things that are that are going to after today they're going to be irreversible okay and the amount of time that i've been standing here this morning statistically Okay, 4,000 people, that decision has been locked down for them this morning. Something has been nailed down, has been solidified, people's eternal salvation or eternal damnation, whichever it is, some in each category, I'm sure. Today, that decision was locked down and they're headed to one or two places that will never change. What gets locked down right now, today, matters. Not just for salvation, but also for what is, what's the context? The restoration of a wayward believer. Things are getting locked down right now today. You know, this morning, eternal consequences are happening for believers. There's, I don't have statistics on this, but this morning, somebody today this morning, some believer, some little one is leaving the flock and they're stepping out and, and they are squandering their spiritual inheritance. Somebody this morning, some little one, is, is stepping out of fellowship with God, out of fellowship with the church. Somebody who belongs to Jesus today is building on another foundation. Wood, hay, stubble, something that's going to burn up. Okay, they're not laying up what Jesus said, laying up treasures in heaven. Okay, they're, off, they're off track. Somebody this morning who belongs to Christ is, is turning their back on him. Uh, they're turning his back on his little ones are suffering loss. And if something isn't done about that, that person is going to slip into eternity. Not, not that they're not going to heaven, but they are going to be without the fullness of what Christ died to purchase for them. The full reward, the full fellowship, the full enjoyment that eternity should hold for them. Like it's, going to, it's, it's evaporating this morning. You know, the, I'll end with this, the, the little one chapter book of Jude. You ever read that little one chapter book? I always liked to read those because it was like I could read it in one sitting. It's like one chapter. I, I'm not picking Psalms, right? <laughs> but that little one chapter book of Jude, down at the end of the chapter, verse 23, uh, Jude is talking to believers and he, he uses this phrase. I love this phrase. He says, save others by snatching them out of the fire. Well, I mean, I think you could use that to talk about salvation. Just, somebody gets the gospel, phew, it's like saving them out of the fire. But there's a lot of believers that are on fire this morning. Believers are on fire, not in a good way, okay? It's not like, you know, whoo, he's on fire. Not that kind of fire. I mean, their works are on fire. Their eternal reward is on fire today. 
and you and I are snatching them out of the fire. You ever see those rescue trucks? You know, they go up and put the ladder up, and these guys go in, and they're jerking, you know, babies and dogs out of the second story window because the house is on fire. <clears throat> There's Christians on fire this morning, burning up. Their works are burning up. Their fellowship is evaporating. And God says, they're important to me. Every little one is important to me. Every one, individual one, is important. And he says to us, his other little ones, he says, listen, he says, I want to enlist you to go after them. It's a big responsibility. But he said, this is my plan. He said, this is how we do it. So we'll come back to this next week. We're going to talk about that Jesus has a little more to say here. But let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for the truth that it teaches. Man, how much better off we would be, I would be, to follow these principles, just to, to walk in them consistently. Lord, it matters to you. If there's nothing else that this chapter's taught me. It's that your little ones matter to you. Thank you for such a great love. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the fellowship that you call us to, the richness of it. Man, thank you for it. Lord, we also lift up to you this week. You know, this is a week of going back to school. Lord, uh, you know, a lot of teachers this week going back to classes. The academy's getting cranked back up. Uh, there's going to be a lot of little ones here, like physically, like little humans <laughs> running around, and we thank you for them. Pray that uh, this week, that is, uh, everybody goes back to school. We pray that um, that you would be glorified, that you'd be exalted, that you would be taught, that you'd be spoken of. Help us to speak, to use our words, use our actions, use our opportunities with other people, to speak of you, to point people toward you. And Lord, um, this morning, even as we were reading about being reconciled, Lord, we pray if. Uh, if the responsibility is, is ours this morning to go to someone, that we would do that. And Lord, if we know that if it's us, maybe that we're the one that's out of fellowship. Maybe we wouldn't wait for them to come to us, but we'd go and be restored to them. Lord, we pray just understanding this morning how important it is to you. Lord, we uh, thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.